Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday evening Bible study. We're going to start a new study this evening in the book of James that came right after the book of Hebrews that we just finished studying last week. So while you're getting your Bibles and turning to the first chapter of the book of James, I'll share a blessing that God has given to me and that uh, kind of easy this past weekend was Father's Day. So it was a, a nice day to honor the fathers at church. And I also was honored by cards and calls and texts from my kids and even grandkids. So it was a, a nice uh, Father's Day. Enjoyed uh, spending the afternoon at home. And uh, so it was a good blessing. If you have your Bibles turned to the book of James, chapter number one, we'll get started in our study through this rather short book in the New Testament. James was the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about being raised in the same home as the Lord Jesus Christ, who had no sin in his life at any time. So you would be in a house where we have a sin nature and we occasionally get in trouble for the things that we do or say at home and uh, get disciplined by our parents. And yet here would be this brother of James, Jesus, who didn't ever sin, who always would have honored his mother and father and would have uh, always done the right thing. Probably been a little bit difficult for James and the other brothers and sisters in the family. And we believe that James and uh, his other brothers, Jude especially, who also wrote a one chapter book in the Bible, the book of Jude, were not believers until after Christ rose from the dead. And then they became believers. And even James, I think, became probably the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And his name is the first one that's mentioned in that council of Jerusalem when Paul and Barnabas uh, and Titus went up to Jerusalem to the council after the first missionary journey. And there was the discussion about whether the new believers had to keep the law of Moses or not. And when the names of James, uh, uh, John and Peter were given, James name was given first. And this particular James was not the brother of John. By that time, that particular James, the apostle, had been martyred. But this James that wrote the book of James was the half-brother of Jesus. So I'll begin reading in verse number one. It says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. Many times before we've made comment about this word bondservant comes from the Greek word doulos, which means slave. So even though James was a half brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, in his humility when addressing the readers did not claim to be Jesus' half brother, but instead referred to himself as a bondservant or a slave, not only to God, but also to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there he gave the full name and title, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is Lord. Jesus was his given name, directed by Gabriel to his mother uh, prior to her even being conceived in her womb with the Lord Jesus. And Christ represented his title the Messiah. So here we see that James regarded himself as a slave to Christ and also had trusted him as his Lord and Savior. He addressed this letter to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. You probably recall me saying that I am a premillennial dispensationalist, which means I believe that the Lord Jesus will physically return to earth prior to setting up his earthly 
millennial kingdom. And then it will be not just an earthly kingdom, but it will be a universal kingdom over all the universe. And after that 1,000 year reign on earth, there will come that last effort when Satan is loosed from the pit and brings up another war against Christ and his followers and will be immediately put down. Then will come the great white throne judgment and a new heavens and a new earth and eternity to follow. So there are some hyper dispensationalists that believe that the New Testament church did not start until Paul the Apostle's ministry began, which was several chapters after Pentecost being shared with us in chapter two of Acts. The Apostle Paul's ministry started in the 13th chapter of Acts with he and Barnabas going on the first missionary journey. Well, those hyper dispensationalists also believe that especially since James addressed this letter to the 12 tribes who are scattered abroad, they tend to consider that the letters that Paul wrote and they recognize them as being from Romans through Philemon are meant for our day, the New Testament church. And then they would tend to group those what we refer to as general epistles that would begin with Hebrews and go through um, the book of Jude to a time beyond the church age in the tribulation period or just prior to that and primarily directed to the Jewish people who will be left here on earth. I have a disagreement with that and that's my opinion, but we do notice that James addressed his letter to the 12 tribes that were scattered abroad. Remember that after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and what we normally would consider the beginning of the New Testament church at the day of Pentecost, there was great persecution. And in fact, Paul was one of the main persecutors of the church at that time prior to his conversion to Christ on the road to Damascus. And so because of that persecution, we learned in the book of Acts that the people, the believers were scattered. And so James is writing to these people. In verse two, he said, my brethren count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So maybe when we look at it, that we are to rejoice that God is testing us by these various trials or tribulations to prove our faithfulness and also to strengthen us. Consider for a moment that God allows these trials to come into our lives. Remember that God is sovereign, even though it appears that he's off in the distance and the world seems to be spinning out of control the Bible teaches us that everything is working towards God eternal plan for man and for his coming kingdom and that it's not falling apart as Jan Markell has been quoted as saying many times by many people. Instead, it's the world is falling into place and God is working everything towards bringing about his eternal kingdom. But God then being sovereign could stop anything from happening. Think for a moment about, I just heard on the way uh, to church, uh, Dr. David Jeremiah speaking about some examples in scripture where people may have thought that the things that they encountered, the trials and the troubles and tribulations they encountered, they couldn't understand why it happened. One of them was Joseph who was hated by his brothers and put into a pit. Some of them wanted to kill him. Reuben said, no, let's put him into a pit. And his idea was that he would come and rescue him out of the pit and send him back to his dad. However, had he done that, he would never have made it to Egypt, never would have been there to interpret Pharaoh's dream. And so 
He was sold into slavery by his brothers to a band of Arabs that were on their way to, to Egypt. And when he was there, he was accused wrongfully of making advances to Potiphar's wife and he was put in prison and he didn't do anything worthy of being put in prison. And yet, had he not been put in prison, he would have not been able to meet the butler and the baker and to interpret their dreams so that then the butler would be able to finally, when it was God's timing, remember Joseph and tell about Joseph's ability to interpret dreams to Pharaoh, who himself had had a couple of dreams. And that paved the way for then Joseph to become the second in command in all of the land of Egypt and to prepare a way for the preservation of the Jewish family, the 12 tribes. And so all those things that looked like terrible trials and testings and unfair things that happened to Joseph, he understood and even shared with his brothers that they meant, they meant things for bad, but God meant them for good. So here James is saying for us to rejoice when we fall into various trials, knowing that the trying of your, or the testing of your faith produces patience. So one of the outcomes of enduring trials and tribulations is that it helps us grow in patience. Verse four, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. Here, wisdom is in the context with trials. I believe that contextually, if we think about this wisdom, it would be wanting wisdom to understand how to make it through the trials or the testings and how to apply them to our lives so that we might grow and mature from it. It says here, let patience have its perfect work. Patience is one of the fruits of the Spirit that Paul gave to us in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, where he said, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and that would be patience. That's one of the definitions of that Greek word that was translated in many of our English Bibles as long-suffering, but it would be patience, as well as kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So patience is one of the fruits of the Spirit. And it says here, let patience have its perfect work. Remember that most of the time when we come across the word that is translated as perfect in our English language, it means to be mature or complete or in the case of fruit, for example, ripe. So let patience come to maturity through the enduring of testings and trials. Verse six, but let him ask in faith, not doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man unstable in all his ways. So if we try to solve problems by ourselves or in our own strength, then we miss God's solution and God's answer and application. So then we end up going back and forth. When we do that, we're like those winds that are tossed to and fro by the wind in the sea, as James was saying. And being double-minded, we miss the wisdom that God would intend for us to gain. Verse nine through 11 gives a perspective about the rich versus the poor. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. In other words, the poor person should be rejoicing that he will be exalted by the Lord. The rich person should rejoice in the opportunities to be humble because whether you're rich or poor, all mankind is like the flowers of the field that soon pass away. 
For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower fails, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. What we might bring to remembrance here is that Paul tells us that we are heirs with Christ. And Christ has said that all things that the Father has are given to him. And when we trust in Christ, we are born into the family of God. And Paul says that we are co-heirs together with Christ. So even though we may be poor in this life, in the next life, in eternity, there will be riches and joys that we cannot even begin to imagine. Verse 12 to, through 18 talks about loving God during trials. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. There are several crowns that we read about in Scripture. I'll mention some of those in a moment. But we can see this crown as a reward. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt in himself anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Long time ago, if you're my age or close to it, you may remember a comedian named Flip Wilson who had a television show and he had this phrase in some of his skits that would say, the devil made me do it. Well, the devil does tempt us and his minions do tempt us. But here James is saying basically the responsibility falls at our feet. He said, each one of us is tempted when we are drawn away by our own desires and is enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. I'm reminded of what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, considering this thought about temptation and sin. Paul said, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. What that means to me is that when I'm tempted to do something that I know is not right, God provides a way for me to recall scripture and to recall that he desires for me to resist temptation. And he provides a way for me to escape the temptation. But what I find in my flesh very similar to what the Apostle Paul mentioned about himself and the struggles that he had in the seventh chapter of the book of Romans. Too often I find that the things that I'm not supposed to do, I find myself doing. And the things that I know I should be doing, I don't find myself doing. So God allows for a way for us to escape temptation. Crowns, as I said, are a reward. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ one day to have our lives examined, to see if after we have trusted in Christ, the things that we build on the foundation of Christ our Savior are if they are like precious metals, like gold, silver, and precious stones that can endure the fire of trial and even be refined, or if the works of our life after becoming a Christian, resemble wood, hay, and stubble, things which burn up in fire. And then the works that we did that would resemble that would be burned up and we would have a loss of reward. So this particular one here is mentioned as the crown of life. We also see the crown of life mentioned in the book of Revelations chapter 2 and verse 10 when the letter was being written to the church at Smyrna that church that was going through tremendous uh, persecution and many of them became martyrs. He said, do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful even unto death and I will give you the crown of life. 
There's also a crown of righteousness that the Apostle Paul spoke about in his second letter to Timothy in verse 8 of chapter 4. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to those who love his appearing. So I believe that those of us who are looking forward to the return of Christ, the rapture of the church, and long for that to happen, will receive a crown of righteousness. Then there's a crown of glory that was mentioned by Peter that was mentioned to teachers and, and elders and, and responsible officers of the New Testament church, the body of Christ. So he said here, when desire or lust has conceived, in other words, become pregnant, it gives birth to sin and sin brings about death. So when our old nature joins with the outward temptation, sin is conceived. Verse 16 and following says, Do not be deceived, my brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. We're reminded many times in scripture not to be deceived. Here he says, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. The Greek word here means to roam or to go astray, to deceive or to seduce. And we're not to allow that to happen to us. It speaks about good gifts and perfect gifts seem to be separate example or kinds of gifts. They come from God the Father, the creator of the lights in the heavens. He also created us, and we are a new creation in Christ. I think about what Paul said again in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Most of the time we would be able to quote Romans 8, 28, for all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. But the very next verse says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So Christ, the firstborn among many brethren, among many believers, Christ was the first one that was raised from the dead. He says here, brought about or brought us forth by the word of truth. We were created anew when we were born spiritually into God's family. Then, if we allow temptation to conceive with our old nature, sin comes about, which breaks our fellowship with God. But John the Apostle said that we, if we're faithful to confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he also said, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, and in fact, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Then John said, we'll have fellowship with one another and the blood of Christ will cleanse us from all sin. Verse 19 and 20 of James chapter one says, so then my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So, if we kind of put this down in simple terms, hear fast, speak slowly, and get angry even slower. <laughs> Wrath of man does not produce righteousness. Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give way to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And there he was quoting from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. Verses 21 through 27, the last portion of chapter 1 of James, talks about being doers of the word and not just hearers. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, 
He's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. The Word of God is like a mirror, and when we compare ourselves with what the Word of God says, it reveals just how we are. And so we're not to forget that, but we're to pay attention to that. <clears throat> this man that does not pay attention, it says here, goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks to the perfect law of liberty, or the word of God, and continues in it, and is not forgetful, hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious, and does not bridle his tongue, but delivers, but deceives his own heart, this one religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Here where it says lay aside all filthiness is similar to what Paul had to say in Romans chapter 13, verse 11 through 14. And I'm trying to memorize these verses so that I can hopefully repeat them to myself when I come across temptations to do wrong. And uh, I need to be able to not allow myself to be deceived, but to hide God's word in my heart that I might not sin against him, as the psalmist said. And what Paul said in Romans 13, 11 through 14 is, and do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and to make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. So that is what my desire is to remember in my own mind when I come across temptations from the world. The Doers translation, Dr. McGee presented in his notes a little poem that someone wrote. The gospel is written a chapter a day by deeds that you do, by the words that you say. Men read what you say, whether faithless or true. By the way, what's the gospel according to you? I find that pretty neat. Dr. McGee's outline of the verses 20 through 22 through 25, he says verse 22 presents the demands of God's word. Verse 23 and 24 present the dangers of his word. And verse 29 presents the design of his word. We see religious or religion spoken about here in this portion of the first chapter of James. It's a form of the word thracos, if I pronounce that correctly and from the Greek translation. <clears throat> it means a ceremonious worship or being pious. It's only used one time in scripture. Then the word religious is a derivative of that and it's found only four times in the New Testament. Once in Acts, once in Colossians, and twice here in James. I think that's why many times we hear that Christianity is not religion. It is a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Religion equates with doing ceremonies and liturgy and all of those types of things. But Christianity equates to it's already been done. And the relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ, we rely on what he did to pay for our sins when he was crucified on the cross and shed his blood for the payment of our sins. Those Old Testament animal sacrifices, the blood that was shed from them, even though they were innocent, 
only served as a covering for the sin. But when Jesus came as that once and for all and final lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world, the blood that he shed served as our propitiation, the actual cleansing and removal of our sin. So Christianity is not a doing religion. Christianity is a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then because we love him, because of what he has done for us, then we have a motivation to serve him and to do those good works in love. And here James said that when we get to that point, that true service of God that some people might consider to be religious practice, the truest of that would been, be when we visit the orphans and the widows. And when it says visit there, I think that that means provide for their needs and also to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Well, a whole lot of information there in the first chapter of James. We'll be in chapter two next week if you'd like to read ahead. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and for the salvation you've given and provided. Thank you for your word and for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for this book of James. Help us as we go through it in our study that we might make applications of it and the principles that he gives in our lives. As he gives tremendous amounts of scriptural application, principles of life that we can apply. Thank you for those who join us online. We ask your blessings on them. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen. So look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning at Thursday Bible Life today. Have a good evening. Lord bless you.